every Maine business adds value to our state. Celebrate. Diversity adds strength and beauty to our communities. Celebrate. We each have different journeys with a common goal, to prosper and contribute to a vibrant, thriving future in Maine, all to help strengthen the economy. Greenlight Maine and Bangor Savings Bank present Elevating Voices, a celebration of Maine's diverse business community. Good morning, Julie. You ready? I'm ready, let's go. All right, Lori has to show us something. Good morning, Lori. Good morning. Hi, Lori. Hi. Well, tell us, where are we? We are at the Harris Inn's Casco Bay Room. This room is about 3,500 square feet. We use it for large functions. We have corporate events. We have weddings here. For weddings, people can get married outside or inside. And then we have our reception in here with uh, a variety of different food options. This is a very large room, beautiful space. Our decorating uh, changes with each wedding. And then we have great uh, air quality in here and access to the outdoors. So it's just a beautiful space. Yes, we would love to have a green light main party here. Uh, we would love to have you come back for a party. We'd love to host that party. Thank you. You're welcome. Where are you folks off today? So we are going to learn about fashion with Adele at the Antoine Taylor Shop in Portland and the Conti and Brown in Bangor. Well, wonderful. Sounds like you've got a busy day. I hope you have a very wonderful day. Thank you. You too. It's the spirit of New Englanders that inspires all of us to do more. It's in our employees, our customers, and our communities. Every day we do more because at Bangor Savings Bank, we truly believe you matter more. Whether you're cutting edge or looking at a traditional industry in a whole new way, if you want to innovate and if you want to grow, if you're an organization here in Maine, we want to support you. We're the Maine Technology Institute. At Hannaford, you're not just shopping at a supermarket. You're buying local because we're buying local every week. Whether it's fresh produce from a family farm or products from local businesses, Hannaford Supermarkets, greater than groceries. It's an early morning in Portland near Monument Square and time to open at Antoine's Tailor Shop and Formal Wear. The owner is from the Democratic Republic of Congo in Africa. She's a fashion designer with amazing talent and technical skill. She's shown tremendous courage and resilience to build her life here, and she's an inspiration for others who want to pursue their dreams of opening their own business. This outstanding woman is Adele Masengo Ngoe. Tell me about your life in Congo. I had a great life in Congo. I was well established. I was a professor in college in fashion design, and I had my own business. So if people was working for me, we, I was living in a big city in Kinshasa. In 1999, we had uh, this uh, civil war between Congo and Rwanda. They were killing people. It was so dangerous. And they were killing people who have my face, like uh, my morphologies. Because uh, that's how you can be with my face, long face. They say you are just from Rwanda. All they, they were killing people. They were burning people on the street. And it was, no, it was very unsafe for me because I look, uh, when you look at me, if you don't know, uh, I look like a Rwandese, I look like people from East. And then I was exposed to that I could be killed anytime. And then United Nations was coming to save people who have my face, Congolese who have the morphologies like a, a Rwandese or Nilotic morphologies. And that's how lucky enough to be part of that group. And uh, they took us in uh, Cameroon we stayed in refugee camp in Cameroon for eight months. And that was very, very challenging. With three young kids, my kid was every day telling me, can you bring us home? We want to go back to our house, why we are here? They are young kids, they didn't understand. But we had to stay there for our safety because many people were killed through that war. It was very insecure. And then from the refugee camp, we, they brought us, that we, we had all the interview to know us better as a, Refugee, they know our, our, our life, know where we want to live, what we want to do, our plan for the future. 
and they, we spend that time there on doing those interviews and living just in refugee camp. And then from there they brought us to America, that's how I ended up to come in Portland, Maine. That must have taken a lot of courage and strength being a young mother of three. I don't know how I did that, you just by the grace of God, I don't know how. <laughs> So what was the experience like when you got here? Wow, when I get here, it was a lot of frustration. First of all, lack of language. I didn't have no word in English. I didn't know, you say hi, I don't know what you're talking about. That was my biggest frustration. And uh, land in the place with three young children yourself, you don't know the language, you don't have money, you don't know nobody. It was a big challenge. It was very, it was very hard, but I had a lot of help from uh, the community and uh, from a Catholic Charity. Mm -hmm. Catholic Charity was the agency of reinstallation for refugees, and they they taken good care of us when we arrived, even though it was so hard, but they were there for us. Tell me a little bit about the process of how you got to start your business. Being a fashion designer in my head was over. I thought like I'm never going to do that because that time I didn't know I would be able to speak English one day. I was just like, okay, now I'm done. Forget to be a fashion designer, just be a mother raising kids. Mm -hmm. And at that time I was trying to find, uh, to, f to make a living. I have to find job and help my family. And uh, I was lucky enough, I found a job somewhere in my field. And I have to sit behind the machine. It was, that was a challenge for me because I back home I had people, like 30 people was working for me. But because I, I, I need to take a step back to, to be just a, like everybody because I need to make money to take off my family. Mm -hmm. And I worked there for a couple of years as a seamstress and then I decided to leave. I wasn't satisfied for my, with myself and I feel think, keep thinking I can still do better. And uh, one day, uh, it was uh, a Friday, I was doing this work. The work I did, and I charged a client like a $400 for the one work I was doing was alteration to a wedding gown. And uh, after that, I went downstairs to pick up my check, my weekly check. It was 375 And I feel like there's something wrong in my head. I just do work for $400, and then they're paying me <laughs> less than what I do for one person. And that day, I did like oh, four to six people. I was like, I start thinking like I need to, I need to do better for myself. And from there, I start thinking uh, I need to open my own business. I found a place on somewhere on Brighton Avenue. I opened a small business there, but it was challenging because I didn't know, didn't have no idea how business work in America. Mm -hmm. The only thing I have just my skill. I know very well what I have to do, but uh, beside that business part, I didn't have no idea. I opened the business anyway because I was so tired to be working for people and then I feel like I can do it myself. I did it for a couple of years, but it was challenging again because it was the time when the economy was not very good in the country. Mm -hmm. I, I have to close. I was lucky and again, my uh, previous job, David Brother, they called me and then they promote me to be, a business, uh, to be a manager in my department. That was better. All, I had all the training, how to do customer service, how to manage people, how to deal with clients, all those stuff. It put me in a better position. I was now ready. A few years after working there, I was ready to open my own business. The previous owner of my business, my actual business, Antoine, mm -hmm. he was retiring. And then I was like, OK, I can't miss this. And that's how I buy the, it was my dream come true to have my own business on downtown. So tell me a little bit about the kind of work that you do and the kind of services that you provide? Uh, we do rental tuxedo, we do, we sell suits, we design clothes for women, mm -hmm. like uh, anything, you name it, for men and women. We do wedding gowns, special occasion, mother of the bride, mm -hmm. anything from scratch. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do a lot of alteration and I do a lot of alteration for wedding. Yeah, and my clientele is uh, every, all kinds of people, all range of people. I have uh, American, Native American. I have a lot of African from mm -hmm. all over the world. I have every, all kinds of people coming to me. African fabric is a trend now. Many people would love to wear African, and sometimes they are not comfortable to wear the full African outfit. I try to put a little bit of uh, African in the Western uh, style to mix them together and to make it something beautiful. Just uh, because I need to to bring what from what I got from my from my, my country of origin and now which I where I call home, 
to mix them together and make something different. I find community everywhere I go. Everybody, my community is white, my community is black, my community is people from Africa, from India, everybody. Make, you make your own community. I started an organization, an organization called Women United Around the World. And, and through that organization, we support immigrant women. I teach them uh, sewing so they can find a better job. So far through the organization, we place more than 50 women for job around, around Portland, around men. In mentorship program for a girl, when I came, I couldn't do, I couldn't know anything except like putting needle, uh, thread in the needle. I start from paper to a small tissues, but today I'm able to do anything. Like the one I've been wearing, I did it on my own. Working with a girl, it's something very wonderful. It's like I could never imagine one day to work with a lady or a woman like her. To me, she's like a mom, a sister, a boss, my friend, everything. She needs everything to me. And I'm so proud to be in her team. I've been supported by many of uh, people in the community. There is uh, my good friend, my client, my supporter, like uh, Marie-Hélène. Marie-Hélène, the owner of Coffee by Design, she's been so supportive. She wear, anytime she have big event, I have to design something for her. There have been many, many dresses that Adele has designed for me over the years, but the pink dress really has a life of its own. It was actually designed for an event, and before I went to the event, I have a henna artist I work with. The henna artist actually took a photograph of me lounging on her couch after she had done the work. And I felt the photograph had really captured the beauty of the gown and of that moment. Unbeknownst to me, the photograph was sent to Burundi by Alain Nehimana, who is the director of the Greater Portland Immigrant Welcome Center, or he was at the time. He has since passed, unfortunately. Alain sent the photograph to an artist in Burundi and commissioned him to do a painting of that photograph, but really capturing the beauty of this gown, designed by a Congolese designer that I had the absolute gift of wearing and owning. I, I always, it's not me in the pink, it's the pink dress. <laughs> I couldn't believe in, in the world, like a, somebody like me coming from Congo, a black woman come and live in uh, this uh, snowy place, and, but uh, I don't regret being here. Man is my home. I love men and I'm so happy to be part of this community. Running a small business here in Maine is personal. At Kennebec Savings Bank, you'll work with local people who are just as invested in your success as you are. Every one of us. Experience the difference at Kennebec Savings Bank today. Located off I-95 in Oakland, First Park is Central Maine's most connected business park. Fiber internet, three-phase power, and pre-permitted sites make it easy for entrepreneurs, innovators, and businesses to start or expand their business. Details at firstpark.com. Eaton Peabody, a Maine-based law firm serving generations of Maine businesses and families from offices in Augusta, Bangor, Brunswick, Ellsworth, and Portland. In this picturesque neighborhood, not far from the Penobscot River, we visited a home of limitless creativity. Hi, Jolene. Hey, Jason. How are you? Good, how Welcome are you? to our house. Thank you. Thank you. Virtual, Virtual hug. Virtual hug, yeah. <laughs> the power couple known as DeConti and Brown graciously shared their special connection. Well, we, we grew up together. We are in the same grade. We were gymnasts together. We were always, you know, really good friends. and. There's a picture of, um, of us when we first met at her fifth birthday party, and I don't really remember that. I do remember um, when she came, when she moved to Maine, and um, we were in first grade at Indian Island School, and I remember that morning lining up, you know, um, the nun would come out, she'd ring the bell, and we'd all line up, and I remember Donna that morning, I remember what she was wearing and how her hair was cut and everything, so yeah. yeah. 
So what was life like, both of you, together growing up on the island? You know, when, when we were young, we were, we were very fortunate to, um, to have a weekly class where they would, they would take us, you know, um, for part of the day. Um, we called it, they called it culture class. We called it culture class. And um, they would teach us a, a whole variety of things, you know, beadwork, basketry, singing, dancing, how to canoe, how to trap. So all kinds of different the skills. The pounding of the ash the, for basketry. Yes, I mean, we, we did that a they, lot. They taught us how to make rope out of out of cedar bark. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, just all these really, really cool traditional skills and techniques. So is that where the whole spark began with your, um, you know, making jewelry and the basket weaving? I always tend to say, like, as native people, we seem to we seem to be. Um, naturally creative and I, I don't you know know why that is you know maybe through necessity to have to you know make everything that you use you know we didn't have stores where we could just go and pick up the things that we need like we do nowadays you know um, so if we needed a certain thing we had to make it you know and a lot of things are made on the spot as you need them and I think that cultivated that creativity and that um, the ability to use your hands to create all the different things that you need um, and just the, the beauty in, in, in our Wabanaki culture. When I started uh, creating the jewelry and we started working on it together and doing shows, we saw that people really connected with what we were doing. They loved the fact that it was different, um, that it was sort of outside of the box of what you might think um, Native American jewelry is supposed to be. And, and I love that. There's one thing that I don't like is to be put into a box or a silo or a category, you know, because of, of, of who I am. You know, I, I, I always happen to say that, you know, I'm a, I'm a creative who happens to be Native American. Our family and our, and our people, our community, um, what we've found is um, they're, they're very proud of, of what we do. What they really like about what we do is we take the beauty of our tradition and we reinterpret it into a modern sort of context. Be because of what we do, we feel like we're sort of unofficial representatives of our people, you know, so we always try to make sure that, that we, we put our best foot forward and we present, you know, beautiful quality work um, that will tell our story and, and show the beauty of, of where we're from. Come on in this way, Julie. This is our studio. This is where we make all the jewelry. Wow, this is huge. <laughs> awesome. I spend so much time in this room. This is the hub of, of all of the jewelry making and the, the jewelry creation right here. For years, Jason worked outside of Maine at International High End Jewelers. He acquired all the skills to return home and let his artistic mind flourish. Like that. And then with that mark, I can take these flush cutters and um, snip my wire right there. Then I can take that and bring it over here onto my hot plate, and then I fire up the torch. I can bring that heat right there. Now this is Argentium silver, <clears throat> which is pure silver in germanium. It's finer than sterling silver, hypoallergenic, highly tarnish resistant, and it's stronger. It has a beautiful color like platinum. After the design work and crafting is finished, Jason and Donna spend more countless hours traveling to international exhibitions where people appreciate their unique pieces of art. You could say it's supreme jewelry fit for a supreme justice. We met Justice Ginsburg at Santa Fe Indian Market. She approached um, our booth and was looking at our work and um, and of course it was very hectic, you know, and lots of, you know, there was 10 people and everybody's like, I want, you know, how much? And did it? So somebody kind of leaned in and got my attention and said, Justice Ginsburg would like to purchase this. And that just snapped me right out of like, I, you know, my unfocusedness. And that piece was, uh, again, it was, a, it was a free form Maine quartz druzy from the mountains of Western Maine. And um, I had done all the little sprig work around it and, and it really resonated with her, so. For people at home who don't understand art couture, that's a big deal. It, it was all very natural because, you know, working in the jewelry industry and, and designing and creating jewelry for so many years i mean it it was just one of those things where we realized women and, and men people um, wear jewelry and they need fashion to go with that jewelry so it just went hand in hand so it was very natural and and um 
you know, participating in more larger uh, jewelry shows, um, being exposed to some uh, fashion shows really sparked our interest. We really started with creating our own regalia, you know, our own traditional dance clothing. And that's kind of uh, how we learned, you know, a little bit about sewing and, you know, things like that. It became clear that Donna's patience lends to her craftsmanship. It's in every bead she sews, every dance where she celebrates and pays tribute to her culture. So this is what you wear to a tribal dance? Yes. As you see here, we have the beaded moccasins. This is the first pair and only pair so far that I have fully beaded. Typically, our uh, moccasins are made of deer and moose hide, but I purchased a really lightweight canvas shoe and beaded onto the shoes. This took me approximately three weeks to bead. And what about this? This is part of your dress? It is, yes. So uh, our women, when, when we dance, we wear uh, what, what are called leggings, and we wear a legging under our skirts and dresses, and we adorn them. So. Again, I have the beadwork, um, the, the symbolic uh, trillium leaf that is, uh, trillium flower that is found within Maine. And then we have the Wabanaki uh, double curve design. And then this here is the first beaded belt I ever made. This has approximately 30,000 plus beads on it, beaded on a loom um, and Jason embroidered uh, my initials and uh, sewed it to the satin. And then of course he did the uh, metal work um, to attach my belt. At Martin's Point, we make Medicare easy, so you can focus on the good stuff. Our Generations Advantage plans offer complete coverage and all-in-one benefits that Mainers trust. The time to switch is now. Call or visit us online today. Sutherland Weston, helping businesses start, grow, and expand in Maine. And empowering business owners to be persuasive and prepared. Smart. Responsive. Creative. SutherlandWeston.com. ARB's advisors are providing savvy solutions to Greenlight Maine startups, closely held businesses, and organizations that operate internationally. And we're doing it the way you'd want Mainers to, guided by our local sensible values. I'm Penobscot and I come from Indian Island, which is an old town in the Penobscot River. And um, it's our traditional village. Um, Penobscot people have always inhabited this island. We've always had a village there for between 10 and 12,000 years, making us one of the few tribes in the United States that was never forcibly relocated to a reservation. We still live on land and in a village that we've always lived in. The Abbey Museum is an, a museum that is focused on the history, cultures, and arts of the Wabanaki peoples, the people of the Don, uh, which are a collection of tribes up here in the northeast, uh, the, the area that we call the land of the Don. One of the things that's different is uh, with the Abbey experience, you're going to see uh, not just um, historical pieces, but you're going to be able to see the new pieces, the, uh, the, the new art that gets created, uh, you know, that is still based off of our ancestral knowledge, but uh, is uh, showcased in new languages. The work that Jason and Donna do is a prime example of the dynamic nature of, of any native culture, and especially Wabanaki peoples. Um, too uh, often in American popular culture, uh, native peoples are uh, portrayed uh, only in the past. The, the sense of, of, of uh, the average American, of the authentic uh, native person, uh, is only the people that were here pre-contact. Um, and that's just a, 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 a sad um, misinterpretation of 
of uh, you know any culture which is uh, dynamic in, in any uh, you know aspect and our uh, Wabanaki ancestors even with the arrival of colonization um, knew that you know uh, improved technology was something that they could take advantage of to improve their lives uh, metal tools and things like that and so uh, we have a history uh, you know of going back even to pre-colonial days of, of trading technologies with other tribes uh, and improving our arts and cultures uh, and uh, expressions and so this is really part of our culture is to change and to update What a gorgeous outfit. Who do we have here today? This is Anna, and Anna is Penobscot. She's wearing a red pants suit outfit that we created um, with the train. The color red is significant of um, our ancestors who are called the red paint people, and they used to paint their bodies with the red ochre mineral found here in Maine. The sides of the pants are adorned with glass cut beads and Swarovski crystals fashioned after uh, traditional Wabanaki beadwork. Wow, this piece makes me really happy. It reminds me of one of my favorite things, the night sky. This dress is covered in Swarovski crystals which represent the star sparkling in the sky. The um, star that you see on the front is actually the Arcturus star, um, a very bright star in the northern sky. And it's overlaid with traditional Wabanaki beadwork patterns. The jacket as well is also beaded in white glass cut beads. We love the graphic uh, pattern of the black and white and it's accented with long uh, black and white uh, coordinating fringe and the dress is accented with shawl fringe as well and Swarovski crystals and blue glass cut beads for an added sparkle. This is dramatic. There's got to be a story behind this piece. There's an incredible story behind this piece. This piece is hand painted. It's called Armored Beauty. The jewelry that you see on her neck, her collar, it's raw tourmaline, raw citrine, and a bunch of different metals worked together and adorned with um, these really beautiful and graphic pheasant feathers. Um, there's spikes on here, there's beads. Um, again, all the painting that you see on here is done by hand. A very powerful and very uh, meaningful story that I would love for Donna to explain. Yes, this gown is a true representation of women's inner beauty, strength, confidence, and empowerment. This gown was designed to send the clear message of consent, which is why we strategically placed the spikes around various sections of the garment, including the shoulders, arms, wrists, and bodice to really give the message forward of the importance of respecting women and consent. So your jewelry led to the fashion, the fashion shows led to we need music, and that is how Firefly is born. And congratulations because you launched Arts Across America for the Kennedy Center last fall. You know, I really wanted things to be original, you know, I didn't, it just felt right to me to, if we were going to create these, you know, outfits that we're going to send down the runway, that we should really create the music to go with it too, because it all tells a story both visually and, you know, and with your ears, you know, what you hear, and these traditional songs, they're not my songs, I'm just, I just have the honor of carrying them forward, so I feel like it's, for me to be able to share them with my community, you know, that that's very important, and so, you know, um, this, I believe in April or May, I went live for the first time with a hand drum and sang, and then November 30th, I'm performing nationally for the Kennedy Center. I just, absolutely mind-boggling. Hey.